Hello, I'm Tony Robinson of Restoration of Torah Ministries, and I want to uh, teach again on this question of who is the woman in Revelation chapter 12. And today, uh, we are going to make sure that we pinpoint who this woman is. So who is the woman of Revelation chapter 12? Well, um, as I said many other times, Revelation was not written in a vacuum. Uh, and that it's actually a compendium of many prophecies from the Tanakh or the Old Testament. So my suggestion is that we begin there. And that's where, that's, that, that's, that's the mistake that uh, many expositors and theologians uh, make, Christian theologians, uh, because uh, they study the New Testament at the expense of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. In other words, um, well, let me put it this way. Dispensationalism is one of the, uh, the main factors that comes into play that affects people's theology and how they interpret Scripture. And so because of the fact that in most circles, the church believes that they are the new Israel or that they've replaced Israel in some kind of way, or even if, uh, even if theologians don't believe that the church has replaced Israel, they believe that, well, Israel, God has just put Israel on the side for a while, and now is the church age, right, you see? So uh, he's dealing with uh, the church age, and once the last Gentile gets saved, then he will uh, go back to Israel, uh, which could not be further uh, from the truth. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we use our foundation. Remember the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is the foundation for the entire Bible. And uh, we neglect it at our own peril. So uh, there are a number of either direct quotations and or allusions to the Tanakh in the, in the book of Revelation. And so therefore, let's look to the Tanakh for help. Let's see what the Tanakh says uh, and what it can teach us about who this woman is. Because again, um, not only was the Bible not written in a vacuum, it is one complete revelation. What we call the Old Testament and the New Testament is one complete revelation. And so we shouldn't divide it up uh, as has been done. The other thing that we need to do is that we need to study thematically. We need to make thematic connections, okay? We need to make thematic connections. We need to, to, uh, to, to take scriptures that have similar themes, situation, words, phrases, circumstances, events, and connect them together. And then when we connect them, we compare them and we contrast them. And it's this process of comparing and contrasting scriptures that are thematically connected together. It is that process that will unfold uh, Adonai's wisdom for us. So let's do that. All right. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. Okay, so where should we start? Let's start with the fact that she's wearing a garland. Uh, which elsewhere is translated crown, is from the Greek word Stephanos, and it's indicative of authority, dominion, and rulership. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, when it talks about the horseman, and it says that he, uh, that he was given a crown, it's the same word in the Greek as Stephanos. And it, it's, um, it's not a kingly crown. It's, it's more of like the, the, the laurel, uh, the garland uh, that they would place on the head of a victor, right? Uh, there is a word that means, uh, a more specific word that uh, has the connotation of a kingly crown, and that's, uh, I think it's diadem. Uh, I'm sure I didn't say that right, and I didn't prepare for it, but it's a version of the word diadem. So, for instance, uh, I do know this. In Revelation 19, I believe it's verse 11, when Yeshua returns, it says that he had on his head uh, uh, many crowns, and that word is uh, derived from uh, that word is derived from diadem. Okay. So anyway, uh, automatically we know that this woman has authority, dominion, and power and, and rulership. Okay. That's the point we want to make. So we want to just start off right there. This woman has, uh, she's dressed 
enclosed indicative of her authority and dominion. And so that's one of the first things we need to look for. Uh, another hint as to the identity of the woman is her garland of 12 stars. It says 12 stars. And again, as I said, if we start off in the quote unquote New Testament or the what I, what I like to prefer to as the apostolic writings, um, when we, if we start off there, we can miss this. And so again, we need our Torah foundation. So as soon as, as soon as it mentions that there are 12 stars, we need to start thinking about how numbers are used in the scriptures and numbers mean things in the Bible. Okay. Numbers mean things. Numbers hint at things. Numbers teach us different things. Uh, so, for instance, the number three is the number of resurrection. And so that's why uh, as you go through the Tanakh, if you see the number three, thirty, three hundred or three thousand, that passage may be Messianic prophecy intending to teach us something about the death, burial and resurrection of the Messiah. Well, the number 12 has a meaning also. Twelve is the number of divine government and or theocracy in Israel. Okay, 12 is, that's, the, that's what the number 12 means, divine government or theocracy in, in Israel. So, and as an example, uh, there were 12 sons or 12 tribes of Israel, right? In the book of Judges, when it recounts uh, the different judges that Adonai raised up to help deliver, save, and rule over his people, there were 12 of them who were raised up to govern Israel. Um, there were 12 apostles uh, that were chosen to take forth the gospel and so forth. So there are also 12 foundations in the heavenly Jerusalem, right? So the, the, the heavenly Jerusalem is built on 12 foundations, 12 gates, 12 pearls, 12 angels. And so again, uh, when we go to the Tanakh, that's where we see that the number 12 is associated with uh, theocracy or di 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 uh, uh, divine government. Okay. All right. So we've got a couple of clues here about this woman already. Already we see that uh, she has a crown, a Stephanos, indicative of her authority. We also see the number of 12 associated with the garland around her head. Again, indicative of theocratic government in Israel. Hmm, that's a big clue right there, right? So Adonai's government is through the nation of Israel. It always has been through Israel and always will be through Israel. Um, always through, always has been, at least, you know, once the nation was formed before that, it was the patriarchs. Okay. So these are major clues right here and you can see which direction they're pointing us in already. All right. How about the association of the number 12 with the sun and the moon? Okay. Uh, let's go back to Genesis chapter one. So here is, uh, this is, a, this is a connection here. Remember I told you that we want to make them we want to make thematic connections. We're in the book of revelation, right? We're in the book of revelation chapter 12. Well, what I want to want to suggest to you is that way, way back in Genesis chapter one, we have information that's going to help us interpret Genesis chapter 12. And again, this is why I say we need to stick, stick with our Torah foundation instead of just limiting, to our, limiting ourselves to quote unquote New Testament scriptures the way so many New Testament, well, the, the way so many Christian theologians do. So Genesis 1, 14 through 18, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now, I want you to pick up on verse 16. Then God made two great lights, the greater light. And notice what it says, this greater light, which we know to be the sun, to rule the day. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. So the, the greater light was to rule the day. And the lesser light was to do what? rule the night. Okay, so we have a woman. Uh, she has a crown with 12. All right, so she has a crown. That speaks of authority and power to rule. She has uh, 12 stars. Uh, she has a garland of 12 stars. Again, that's speaking of divine government. And then uh, and it says she was clothed with the sun and the moon. And that's where we make this connection to Genesis 1, 14 through 18. She was clothed with two 
things, the sun and the moon. And it says that the sun and the moon were intended to rule and to have authority. The sun ruling the day, the moon ruling the night, right? And he threw in some stars also to help uh, the moon rule the night. And again, what we see is that this woman is totally decked in emblems of authority, divine authority, theocratic authority, authority in the nation of Israel. OK, and so we get all of this information just by doing what? By making thematic connections, similar words, phrases, events, circumstances, etc. So already this is pointing us. Um, this is pointing us to someone associated with the nation of Israel um, to rule uh, under under theocratic rule. All right. So let's keep going. Um, the point here to, to see is that the sun and the moon were created to rule, govern, and exercise authority. And this woman is clothed with the sun and the moon. In other words, she's clothed with the idea of rulership, right? So it's no co coincidence that there are 12. So as far as the sun and the moon are concerned, and remember I told you that uh, the number 12 was the number of theocratic government. It is... No wonder that, uh, and it's not a coincidence, that there are 12 months that there are associated with the sun and the moon. There are 12 constellations associated with the sun and the moon. And uh, hopefully I, I haven't lost you there when I said constellation. I'm not into astrology, um, but I believe, as many others do, that the 12 constellations were originally given um, to uh, proclaim the gospel in the heavens. And uh, E.W. Bullinger has a great book on that. I think it's called The Witness in the Sky, or Witness in the Sky, something in, of that nature, E.W. Bullinger. And he does a great job of showing how originally um, the 12 constellations were meant to teach the gospel, but they were perverted. Um, as, uh, as people went from the Tower of Babel to all of the other nations, they developed their own types of mythologies about the uh, 12 constellations. And then you have astrology that's born out of that. But originally, um, God intended for it to, uh, speak of the gospel. But um, this woman is clothed with all these things, right? A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, as I said, the woman is clothed in Genesis 1.16 with emblems of authority and rulership associated with the number 12. So we can't get away from this whole idea of authority and the number 12. OK, so uh, let's see what else we can find out about this. Now, uh, we're going to look at Genesis 37 verses 9 through 11. And that is the story of the fledgling nation of Israel, Jacob and his family. And uh, so the question is, have we seen this imagery before of uh, the sun and the moon and stars? Think about that, the sun and the moon and the stars. And yes, we have. So let's look at Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Then he dreamed still another dream and behold, and, and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Okay, so here what we see is a story about Joseph's dreams. And in that dream, we see the sun and the moon and 11 stars. And again, as I said, um, we are making a thematic connection to Revelation 12 with the woman because it said that she was clothed with the sun and the moon and she had a garland of 12 stars. And so this is a, a this is just a, this is a, um, just a good blue collar thematic connection. <laughs> I mean, this is just a down to earth thematic connection, right? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Now notice how Jacob interpreted Joseph's dream. Jacob interpreted the sun and the moon as referring to himself 
and Joseph's mother, Genesis 30, 17, 30, 17, and the 11 stars as referring to his brothers. So in other words, we have uh, a situation here where Jacob is interpreting sun, moon, stars as referring to Jacob, his wife, and his sons, okay? Um, and what we want to think about here is the sun and the moon and the stars. Joseph would be the 12th star to fulfill Revelation 12. 1. Clearly, these refer to Jacob's family in what manner? As the beginning of the nation of Israel, okay? That's what's going on here. In other words, when John wrote Revelation, he was... Uh, 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 he was pulling, he was making a connection to this story in Genesis chapter 37. He uses the imagery of the sun, moon, and stars in Revelation 12 in hopes that we would connect it to Genesis chapter 37. And what we see is that the sun, the moon, and the stars in Genesis 37 are utterly, totally, and completely connected to what? They are totally, utterly, and, and completely connected to the nation of Israel. So this is showing us that the woman of Revelation 12, this is our first, this is, this is our first uh, set of scriptures that clearly point us to the woman as the nation of Israel. Because that's who Jacob, his wives, and his sons are. They are the nation of Israel, a nation with 12 tribes under the, the authority and power rulership of God, a theocracy. So the woman is the nation of Israel. Okay. And it says uh, in Genesis 34, 7, and the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. Now, this is talking about the story of Dina when Dina was raped by Shechem. And uh, it says that the brothers heard it. And, and I want you to, let, let me uh, get rid of that scripture for a second here, because I want, I, I want you listening to me instead of reading that. Ha, ha, ha. Because um, I, I got to work the crowd here, okay? I got to work the crowd. So this is what I want you to think about. Um, so this is when Jacob and his family, they are traveling they make it back into the land, right? So the, 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 he had been in his exile uh, with, with uh, Laban. The, the family made it back to the land of Israel. And the first thing that happens is they have this encounter with the Shechemites. Dina is raped. But here's the point I want you to, to, to see here. That story is the story. That story is the story of, okay, wow, I just lost my thought there for a second. Hmm, I need to get my thought back. Ah, okay, now I remember where I was going. Uh, that story is a story about a man and his family returning to their ancestral plot of land, okay? It's about a man and his family, okay? Would everyone agree with that? Okay, now let's go over here and let's read Genesis 34, 7. The sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing. What does it say? In Israel? Are you kidding me? In Israel? There's no nation of Israel, right? I mean, literally, right? There's no nation. It's a, it's a man. It's, it's a man and his family. But notice what the scripture says here. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. And what's going on here, beloved, is the fact that Adonai sees Jacob and his family as the nation of Israel. In other, in other words, his family is prophetically is a prophetic picture of the of the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, Jacob's entire life is a prophetic enactment of the nation of Israel. If I had one hour with you, 
uh, which I don't. But if I had an hour with you, I would take you through Jacob's life and I would show you all the parallels between his life and the future nation of Israel. Right. Like, for instance, Jacob had to flee from the land. Right. And he went into a faraway land. That's what happened to Israel. Remember that uh, when Jacob came back. And remember, uh, he wanted to see how things were going uh, with um, with Esau. So he sent two people ahead of him and they came back and they said, oh, you know, uh, Esau, he's he's coming at us with 400 men. And Jacob was afraid that is parallel to when Israel sent the 12 spies in. OK. And when it when Jacob uh, when and they brought back a bad report. Remember when Jacob uh, made it to Padan Aram and uh, in one chapter he multiplied himself from just him to two wives to you know the, the uh, uh, 11, 11 sons and a daughter. I, I believe it's 11 sons and a daughter. I mean, just rapid growth. Right. That's the same thing. There's just so many parallels. But anyway, here's the point. The point is that Jacob and his family, they are a prophetic picture of the nation of Israel. And that's why in Genesis 34, verse 7, it says that he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel, even though the nation, the actual nation of Israel did not physically exist, but he represented him and his children. They represented Israel. OK. All right. So quite clearly, uh, the scripture is showing us that um, the woman is Israel. So what about the woman in birth pains in Isaiah 26, 17 through 18? Because uh, uh, one of the things that we notice about the, the woman in Revelation 12, it says that she was uh, in labor to bring forth a man child. Now, look at Isaiah 26, 17 through 18. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs, when she draws near the time of her delivery, delivery so have we been in your sight, O Adonai, O Lord, shall I say. And so what's going on here is that clearly, clearly, the woman in Isaiah 26 is the nation of Israel. And so again, uh, the Tanakh is already taught, has, has already taught us that, hey, the nation of Israel is a woman, right? It's as if she were a woman. And now it's teaching us that, hey, you know what? When you see a woman in pain to deliver a child, that could be the nation of Israel. And so what I want to suggest to you is that based on Isaiah 26, 17 through 18, again, the Tanakh is not making it a secret. It's not making it difficult to understand, nor is the Tanakh trying to hide the fact that the, the woman of Revelation chapter 12 is Israel. A woman in birth pains. OK, so this passage explicitly refers to Israel being in birth pains. The Tanakh already identifies the woman in birth pains, the woman of Revelation chapter 12. And again, this is why I say that many uh, Christian theologians uh, and just many Christians in general um, really miss the boat on this uh, to their own uh, peril. And I don't want to use the word peril, but um, maybe in some cases it's warranted. But um, that uh, is, this is a grave mistake. Uh, the whole idea of dispensationalism and that, well, you know, the church has replaced Israel, that, that is so wrong. And what it does is it prevents us from going back to the Tanakh and seeing its importance and more so than that, than seeing its relevance, okay? Its relevance to today. And I would say specifically in its relevance in interpreting uh, Revelation chapter 12. So this passage is clearly thematically connected to Revelation 12, identifying the woman in birth pangs as the nation of Israel, okay? So the main point is, is that the idea of a nation the idea of the nation of Israel pictured as a woman in birth pains ready to deliver a child is nothing new. It's not a mystery. 
It's not some big mystery where we have no idea what what John is talking about in Revelation. Uh, It's already been mentioned. And if that wasn't enough, let's get a second witness in here. Uh, A woman in birth pains ready to deliver a male child. Let's let's ready to live to deliver a what? (laughs) Almost read over that quickly myself to deliver a what? A man child. Look at Isaiah 66, 7 through 11. Before she was in labor, speaking of the nation of Israel, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child or a man child. Oh, my goodness. We have hit it here. We have made a thematic connection that we've hit it out of the park here. Revelation 12 is about a woman in labor ready to give birth to a man child. And that's exactly what Isaiah 66, 7 through 11 is. For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Also notice that Israel will give birth to a male child, verse 7 in Isaiah 66, just as John prophesied in Revelation 12, 5. So again, what we see is that when we study the Tanakh, the Tanakh has many of the answers that we need in order to understand the imagery uh, of Revelation chapter 12. But as if those two... We're not enough. We have a third witness. Micah 4, 9 through 13 also speaks of Israel as as a woman in birth pangs waiting to deliver her children. It says, now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Oh, my goodness. There it is again. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. This is the nation of Israel. Like a woman in birth pains, just like in Revelation 12, uh, chapter 12. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go, and there you shall be delivered. For he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Uh, This passage in Micah also contains a prophecy that Adonai is going to take Israel out of her land and he's going to take her to Babylon where she will experience her deliverance there in in Babylon. Likewise, in Revelation 12, verses 13 through 16, we see the woman Israel is forced to flee from Israel into the wilderness instead of to Babylon where Adonai will provide Israel and provide provide for her protect her and provide deliverance for her for her not in uh the city not in the actual city but out in the wilderness just like he had said i'm going to ship you off to babylon but there i will deliver you so again we see another clear uh good blue collar connection Uh, to the Tanakh, teaching us that the woman is the nation of Israel. So now that we have identified the woman as Israel, we can exclude all other pretenders and all other imposters. The woman is Mary, the mother of Yeshua. What do we say to that? No, the woman is not, that Mary is not. That the woman is the church, oh my goodness, Uh, this is, this is, uh, That's just, you know, we've already gone through in our previous teaching on how the woman can't be Mary or the church. So what I want you to remember is that Revelation is a compendium of prophecies from the Tanakh. Okay, you just just remember that. Okay, that Revelation is a compendium of many, many prophecies from the Tanakh. And so in order to understand the book of Revelation, we have to understand the Torah and the prophets and the writings. So you notice this, the, the title on this slide is, it's changed from all the previous slides. It says, the woman of Revelation 12 is the nation of Israel. That's who the woman of Revelation chapter 12 is. So <clears throat> none of these, <clears throat> none of the ones above, Mary, the church, uh, or nor the Jerusalem above in Galatians 4, none of those fulfill the prophetic picture of the woman in Revelation chapter 12, as does the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel is the woman of Revelation 12. Thank you for your time. Shalom, shalom. (laughs) 